Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Today I'm super excited to welcome Stefan Deary and Dr. Kyle Paradis to the show. Hey guys, welcome. Hey Dan, how you doing? Hey Dan, delighted to be here. Thanks for the invite. I'm so, so honoured that you join us. We're going to be talking leadership today, transformational leadership, social identity, identity leadership. We're going to be looking that through the prism of coach leadership and uh, athlete leadership. So super excited. We don't talk about leadership enough on the Sports Social Show. So I, I, I'm really excited to be uh, addressing leadership more today. But let's start where we always do. And let's let's start with some introductions. So Stefan, why don't we start with you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I have um, just started on the PhD journey there um, with Kyle and the supervisory team uh, at Austria University. I'm um, looking at coach leadership and uh, particularly transformation leadership and social identity leadership. Um, before I got involved in the PhD, um, I spent 10 years uh, working with the Irish Football Association. Uh, so coaching was um, my uh, my practical background. Um, and I've always had a sort of keen interest in that. It's, it's pr- probably my biggest passion, um, coaching. Um, so during my time with the Irish Football Association, I um, managed to do a master's in sports psychology um, while still uh, being involved there. Uh, and then I moved into uh, teaching. I did a PGC uh, over in the uh, University of Cumbria in Lancaster a number of years ago. So I was uh, PE teaching and uh, got into the university for some part-time lecturing. Uh, mm-hmm. And from there and some discussions with Kyle and uh, Leanne and the team, uh, there was this potential uh, PhD that, that was coming up, um, which was something that I had been crying out for the last decade, Delian, uh, for something like this to happen, but it never, uh, it never did. But whenever the opportunity came, then it was something that I, I couldn't turn down. Uh, so I've been on the PhD journey now um, in the, the coach leadership area. And um, you mentioned uh, about coaching Irish football, and that's that's GAA. Right. No, no, no. It actually was association football. So, oh, it was yeah. association football. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, while I coached GA now uh, for ten years, there I worked under the, the actual um, the football association in Northern Ireland. Uh, I was actually it was a, a new program at the time where um, thirty sort of specialist coaches were developed from both the Irish Football Association and the uh, Ulster GA, and uh, it was run by the Department of Education to. To actually go into primary schools and uh, sort of develop teachers' confidence and competence in uh, their PE delivery, uh, and then on top of that, I was involved in the the, the sort of youth development side of the Irish Football Association. So taking sort of the junior teams and uh, involved in the, the club and I program, which uh, really sort of developed over that that uh, decade that I was there, um, with numerous figures involved. Uh, so yeah, I was in the football association, and then. Uh, my my current coaching um, is in the GA. I've, I've I've played both soccer and GA my whole life, so uh, that's why I was um, between the two. But now I just actually uh, focus on on uh, Gaelic games. Yeah, uh, as somebody who's been blessed with the opportunity to to do a little bit of, of work in GAA over the past uh, year or so, uh, one of the most one of the most noticeable differences. I mean, obviously there's big differences between the two games, and there's big similarities as well but the size of the GAA pitch I mean it is absolutely huge and it they are some they are really fit players really fit players um I mean as a as a coach um and we'll probably delve into this a little bit a uh, little bit more throughout uh, this episode uh, throughout this conversation but as a coach are, are there enormous similarities between the two games from a coaching perspective Oh, it's it's there. There, there's so uh, many tangibles between the two of them. Yeah. Um, and even like while the the decade that I spent coaching in the Irish Football Association was with children, uh, and now my coaching is with um, adults. Yeah. 
uh, I would I would say the same for that. That um, adults are, are always just a um, bigger kids look really, <laughs> and it, it really just depends on how you you set up your coaching and uh, for your engagement and stuff. So um, I think there's there's so many crossovers like, but uh, aye, both both super sports. Both team invasion sports, there's lots of similarities. And and Dr. Kyle Paradis, great to have you on. You're supervising Stefan with his PhD um, around this leadership topic that we're going to be talking about today. But um, tell us a little bit about yourself, sir. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Steph- Stefan's background is much more impressive than mine, I can, I can assure you. But uh, uh, I, I came over to Northern Ireland uh, three years ago by way of Canada. So I... Uh, I took a position as a lecturer at Ulster University in sport and exercise psychology in, in Belfast. And I guess Stefan was waiting for me to come over to uh, to do a PhD in a topic that he was interested in because we have similar interests in, in group dynamics and, and leadership. Um, so it was really nice to have uh, have Stefan, uh, you know, come out of the woodwork, so to speak, and uh, and and knock on the door and, and, and you know, earn, earn the studentship, um, which has been great. Um, so prior to that, I, I did all my, I'm from, I'm Canadian, I'm from Canada, I did all my schooling in Canada. I, I did my PhD at the University of Western Ontario, uh, under the supervision of the late, great Albert Karen. Um, prior to that, I did my master's at the University of Windsor, uh, working with Dr. Todd Lougheed. Um, and that's really where I got into to leadership and athlete leadership specifically, as my, my master's work uh, focused on that. And then prior to that, my undergraduate uh, at, at Laurentian New University in sports psychology um, and, and kind of dipped my toe into the sports psychology and, and research world there. Um, at the time, um, Dr. Mark Eyes was a faculty member there and, and supervised my undergraduate honors thesis. And that's sort of that was my first foray into into sports psychology, into research, and that kind of set me on the path to then go and work with Todd at Windsor, and then ultimately Bert at Western, um, and then end up somehow in <laughs> in Belfast in a in a faculty position supervising Stefan. You're not the first person to mention uh, the great Dr. Bert Karen, um, and actually in those terms, the great Dr. Bert Karen, because. Uh, Dr. Desi McEwen, who's recently been on talking about team dynamics, sure. and Dr. Mark Beauchamp, who gave us a bit of an overview uh, of sports psychology, um, but also has a background working quite sure. closely with Dr. Karen. Um, was was te- was team dynamics, group dynamics, um, leadership uh, a passion of yours from the off, Kyle? Was that something that grabbed you immediately when you started to study sports psychology? Yeah, I, I'd say group dynamics, you know, the, the broader field of group dynamics for sure, and then leadership falling under that um, absolutely was always a, a main area of interest of, of, of mine, you know, when I got into doing sports psychology and, and, and probably taking some some courses, some modules um, in my undergraduate degree and, and, and Mark Eyes at the time was teaching and then when he was talking about, you know, roles and cohesion and, and leadership in, in groups and that those were the topics that really sort of grabbed my attention the most um, and sort of got me interested in doing, you know, doing research projects on, on those areas. Now you both had the um, devastating experience of having to go to Italy <laughs> to deliver at a, at a recent convention where um, a whole pile of sports psychologists um, converged on Padua, I believe it was. And um, I was insanely jealous with all the fantastic uh, photographs coming back um, on on Twitter. It looked like a fantastic convention and at this con- convention, um, you were delivering on leadership, um, specifically uh, transformational leadership and social uh, uh, identity leadership um, with relation to athlete leadership. Uh, and, and, and I got in contact with you, Stefan, because I, I think I saw you advertise this on Twitter. And I thought that's something we have to talk about. We haven't talked enough about leadership on the sports site show. We've we forayed a little bit into transformational leadership. We've talked about social identity theory, um, but we need to talk about this more. Uh, uh, and so, this is this really is your PhD, Stefan, right? So, uh, I mean, listening to Carl there and his passion for group dynamics and leadership is an extension of that. Where does your interest in leadership derive from? 
Uh, oh, Jeepers. Um, <laughs> Big question. <laughs> we could really go down uh, the a rabbit, rabbit hole. hole, yeah, because um, like, f- for me, like leadership's just something that I've been really like curious about my whole life. Um, yeah. I've spent the majority of my um, sport and playing experience um, under various types of leaders um, and coaches. And uh, during that whole time, I've sort of like been thinking in my head, like what way would I like to uh, come across um, and deliver and uh, be to the teams that I that I coach. So I've just I've always been curious about it. And then for me, um, I heard uh, Owen Eastwood, who is a uh, super and talking about this at the moment, where like the ultimate form of leadership is parenting. Um, and for me, that's always been something that I've always thought as well, that, that like for coaching and leadership, you should always treat your, your players and your athletes like you would your child. And with your child, there's there's many occasions where there's there's many different forms and many different hats we have to uh, to wear, um, whether that's um, the, the arm around the shoulder and the, the big hug and comfort um, at times as needed and all our times whenever there's a bit of a drive need to be put in there and uh, inject a wee bit of um, a push. Like, so I have a, an 18 year old there at home and uh, and a eight and a four year old. So on different occasions, they all need a uh, very different forms of parenting. So I would, I would say that that for me transfers right away across the teams and coaching as well, that um, leadership is not a one size fits all. Um, and the, the best leaders in my eyes, the ones that I've um, like studied and looked at, um, can can have that sort of balance of the, the individualized approach. What I'm getting from you is a real interest in leadership because it's not obvious. Leadership isn't obvious. I mean, perhaps historically in coaching, perhaps there's been uh, we've been guilty of going in one direction that sort of class of top down i mean the popular view perhaps of sports leadership sports uh, coaches leader tends to be top down instructional um authoritative hopefully not too authoritarian but authoritative uh, somebody who is an expert in their uh, chosen sports, their 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 domain, their field. Um, but as you're really speaking to there, that leadership isn't necessarily obvious, and there are lots of forms of leadership. And two forms that you're yeah. studying closely are are transformational leadership and identity leadership. Um, so, uh, should we start with, let, let's unpack these because we've briefly spoken about some of these on the sports science show, but it's been such a long time and I certainly need to revise my understanding of this. So, uh, transformational leadership, let's, let's start there. What is transform transformational leadership, Stefan? Yeah. Well, before we just jump into that and, um, uh, even down the line discussing mm-hmm. about athlete leadership, that, that point you made there about how leadership is maybe changing, I think we are seeing across um, the, the sporting world and even like uh, the organizational setting, business setting, where this hierarchical form of leadership is, is slowly changing us. And we are seeing more of a, a growth in that horizontal yeah. form. Um, and these two leadership approaches that we'll discuss now for me appeal to me because of they, they provide that capacity um, to open up to the, the, the followers within, within the group. That they're yeah. under um, supervision. So we'll, we'll discuss transformation leadership first. Then. Yeah. Um, so coming from the organizational setting, um, it's a style of leadership that involves empowering, inspiring, uh, and challenging one's followers uh, to facilitate individual, team, and organizational outcomes. Um, according to Bass in 1997, so he uh, developed this form of leadership to sort of explain how leaders are able to motivate others so that they like, perform beyond expectations. And there's sort of four key domains within it. Um, first, they would show inspirational motivation and uh, part by defining like a desirable mission. Um, and like we can talk down the line about another study that I'm doing, but I'll just give an example of like one of the, the teams that I looked at it was Donegal in GA terms. And this is a team that, uh, 
had gone numerous years without winning um, the GA, the, the like the Ireland final, uh, and were for many the laughing stock of GA game. Like, and whenever one of their coaches came in, Jim McGuinness, he, he brought the team into a, a hotel in Donegal and uh, pretty much produced a like a, a newspaper article of where wh- how they were viewed by the public and that used like Disney characters um, to sort of to uh, talk about various county teams. So. They were um, depicted as goofy. Um, right, that's yeah. flattering. Yeah, Thanks yeah. for that. Um, <laughs> so he pretty much in his early stages of defining that mission, he was like, "Well, is this what we want to be like? Is this is this how you want to be remembered?" Um, and like from the get go, he he pretty much stated that he wanted to win in Ireland, and uh, what did they need to do as a management and as a player um, to, to to achieve that? Like so, straight away there for first meeting I set that mission um the next one is like they exert idolized influence by like sort of modeling desirable behavior um so they have like a high level of enthusiasm for the team and in many cases they're they're experts in like being mood thermometers so they know when the group's down and they're needing lifted um and can just have a, a really good gauge of what what's going on within the group whenever um, maybe things are getting a bit loose and the expectations or the standards have dropped and they can push those back in as well. And they're just role models for the team. The, the third one is that they would provide followers with like intellectual stimulation. And by that, um, I mean like in, engaging them in the, the team plans and strategies. So um, whenever we're talking about horizontal forms of or shared leadership, we're seeing more and more now input from players, um, from like senior leadership teams within within the setting where they're given feedback on uh, the games themselves and maybe given their viewpoint on how things uh, went wrong, what went right, uh, how they can make things better. Um, so uh, there's much more inclusion there. Um, and then finally, the last one is that having that individualized consideration. So we spoke there about like good leaders understand the, the individuals in front of them being sensitive to the, to the needs of the different players and knowing that um, like certain players mightn't like being called out in front of the rest of the group. Um, it might be a case of speaking to them uh, privately and whatever is the feedback you're wanting to give. Um, so that that's, that's the transformational side of things. That's really fascinating. So reflecting back some of the things I've heard, from you there transformational leadership essentially was made popular by this mo- uh, this leadership guru bernard bass who the transformational leadership is essentially as the name suggests you know transformational is about empowering people inspiring them motivating them and it really is underpinned by four eyes i think i heard inspirational leadership and you talked about jim mcginnis there at donegal gaa and and how he uh created this desirable mission um so he inspired them in this way almost if, if felt like he inspired them from a position of negative in terms of well, you don't want to be like this rather than working towards we want to win a championship more away from looking goofy essentially which i think is really interesting um idolized influence is in uh, they model the behaviors that they want others to engage with they're experts on the emotional temperature of the organization there's still a sense yes it's about empowering and inspiring and motivating motivating but it it still requires intelligence and uh, and stimulating others intellect so very much being player centered and player inclusive and getting players to collaborate finding solutions solving problems and then individual considerations um in terms of you know we're, we're going to treat people as individuals uh, we're going to appreciate who they are coming to you kyle is this a model that has grasped your attention as an academic over the years it, the, the theory the practical side side of things from a from a, a team and, and group perspective yeah, absolutely. Even when I got started getting into some of the leadership research back in my master's, transformational leadership was certainly on the forefront and you know, from, from Bass and Bass and Evolio. And really it was part of a larger framework called the full range model of leadership. And so Bass and Evolio would explain that uh, on the one end of the spectrum, you have these transformational leadership behaviors that Stefan really, really explained very well. But then you kind of have 
down the other end of the spectrum, you kind of have transactional leadership and then almost a, a, a laissez-faire, non-leadership, absence of leadership. And and so really what the research shows is certain leadership behaviors are required in certain situations and for certain teams and, and, and groups of people, depending on maybe the age and stage of athlete. And so it's not to say that yeah, everyone has to come out of the gate firing with transformational leadership, but knowing when and, and picking your moments of delivering the right types of behaviors. And so transactional leadership behaviors, you know, using rewards as well um, to, to motivate it can, can be useful as well. But it, it, it's sort of finding that right balance of, of knowing when to engage in transformational behaviors, when to engage in transactional behaviors. And we see a lot of the sport leadership research over the years when we look back to uh, Chela Durai and uh, the multidimensional leadership for sport, you know, looked a lot at sort of the, the leadership congruency hypothesis and what are the preferred leader behaviors that the athletes want from their coach versus what's required of the situation and then what's act, what are the behaviors that the coach is actually providing. And it's sort of that congruency between those three considerations is where you, know, you, you start to see the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of a leader for a situation. Uh, and so Chela Durai looked at a lot of these different leadership behaviors transactional and then we kind of as, as the leadership research emerged and, and, and evolved uh, we started looking at different types of leadership behaviors which you know kind of brings us into Stefan's work um, you know lots of uh, lots of researchers started to look at transformation leadership in sport and now uh, social identity leadership as well which uh, which we'll, which we'll talk about yeah absolutely this has been uh, been an area of interest for me certainly when I was looking at uh, athlete leadership uh, back in my master's yeah, that's really, really fascinating. Because as, as you were speaking now, I was thinking, well, when would a coach, and I understand these things aren't necessarily clean cut, of course they're not. Um, and I can imagine they vary from moment to moment, let alone from session to session and then day to day and week to week. Um, when might a coach be engage in what might be considered transformational when might a coach engage in what could be considered as transactional and surely um individual differences plays a part here i mean i've definitely worked in teams where players have said i'm not that worried about having a particularly close relationship with my coach and all the bells and whistles there i just want them to tell me what to do and to teach me how to play my sport that's enough for me and i don't know that might be a, a fairly crass example of somebody who requires more than not transactional uh coaching or leadership i mean does that does that ring true with you stefan as somebody who has great experience in both an academic and uh, applied world here as a coach, as a PE teacher, surely the individual, him or her themselves, it's their attitude towards their relationship with that coach that influences whether it's going to be transformational or transactional. Does that ring true to you? Yeah, like th this is the, the sort of crux of where we're, we're trying to get to eventually that um, we feel that there should be a leadership toolbox that everybody should have an awareness that they have this this golf bag pretty much um on their shoulders and it's having an un understanding and an awareness that at different times at different contexts at with different people yeah. um it's it's having an awareness of what's the most appropriate uh style of leadership to use in that moment um so totally context dependent um like even if like i've, I've been watching the arsenal all or nothing um series on amazon lately i don't know if you've yes. been keeping an eye on it but i find it like really like fascinating like watching um uh, michael arteta and like while i've been baffled at times of uh, some of his tricks before games with light bulbs and um <laughs> as, as, as <laughs> he's, he's he's playing some um pictionary games with them as well and drawing drawing pictures on the boards and stuff but uh, in terms of like, if you think of how he um, reacted, responded to the Aubameyang situation, and um, how they were like sort of under pressure as a team at the time, and how he pretty much said, "No, he's gone from the group. He excluded him. Um, pretty like just real. That was it. He uh, broke the values of the behaviors of what he expects of an Arsenal player, and mm. um, like." that was one side to him and he showed that sort of ruthless streak there where whereas then you see other um like in the same maybe episode uh he's around his arm around um carrio uh, saga like 
guiding him and giving him sort of advice on his game, showing him um, little movements to make, like on, on two different instances with two different players there, you can see like very different styles of leadership at play, like with the same person. Yeah, those documentaries are fascinating to illuminate some of these uh, psychological theories. Yeah. That's transformational leadership. Talk to us a little bit about identity leadership. We've spoken on a few episodes about social identity theory. So I assume there's a close relationship here, or it might be very much one of the same one one and the same thing. But uh, tell me a little bit about identity leadership. Yeah, well, it, it integrates um, social identity theory and uh, self categorization theory. So bringing together Turner's and Tajfel and Turner's. Um, theories on that um, and it suggests like sort of to be effective leaders um, you need to embrace the power of the collective um, that comes from that sense of uh, shared identity um, that brings people together and um, that allows them to go much further um, than they think they can or uh, what they they think and act possibly as is like um, lone rangers or lone entities Okay. Um, so it's like this process of like social influence um, by developing your team members to think, feel, and behave as group members rather than as individuals. Um, so again, like very, very similar to um, ident or to transformation leadership, but it has your four A's again. Um, so the first one's like identity and entrepreneurs. So leaders can bring people together to create like this shared sense of we and us within the team. Um, then we have um, identity prototypes um, where the leaders sort of, again sort of similar to transformation leadership they like represent the the values and the, the behaviors of the group uh, and then identity impresarios so devising those structures and activities um, that allow the group members to live out this sense of shared social identity that that sorry was identity impresario yeah nice okay <laughs> And um, so that that's basically curating activities to live out our values and and behaviours. Pretty much, yeah. To gotcha. bring the, the team together there collectively, and then um, ident or sort of to be like sort of in group champions, uh, so to promote the interests of the group. Yeah. Um, rather than their own personal interests and uh, the interests of others, and okay. um, so like pretty much leaving leaving that ego behind and. Um, pretty much all for the team, uh, so which you'd hear uh, across the board in the, both professional and grassroots setting. Like. So what you've just described there, I mean, speaking to your example of Mikel Arteta at Arsenal, I mean, very much, it, it sounds to me like, I, I mean, he might not define himself as such, but it sounds to me like he's an identity leader. Yeah, 100%. Um, but like, I think, if we go back even to the Jim McGuinness example there, which I used earlier, um, yeah, like you could say the exact same for him. Um, okay, where like and I suppose in GA, it's it's very unique in that it's um, like very much ingrained in identity with like your your plan for your county uh, against other counties. It's not like professional soccer where you can transfer from team to team. Um, but again, though, whenever it comes to being, um like defining those behaviors and those values like he pretty much set the stall out from the, the get-go of how he felt the team should uh, develop this was jim mcginnis who took donegal to win the gaa championship from absolutely nowhere and moved into soccer didn't he so went to celtic yeah. and did some work there similar to myself did his masters in sports psychology at ulster university and then um no sorry uh did it at john moore's okay. i think it was john moore's yep. Um, and uh, then went to Celtic as a performance psychologist um, sort of while continuing his role with Donegal and then moved there permanently and had brief stunts with Roger Smith at uh, a club in China. I'm not too sure which club it was now, but yeah. What sounds really exciting to me, I mean, coming to you here, Kyle, um, would I be right in thinking that transformational leadership, identity leadership, these can go hand in hand. We can amalgamate the two. I mean, we've talked about transformational leadership being along a continuum with transactional leadership. Uh, do, does identity leadership, is, is, that a, is that an easy fit into this transformational lens? Or uh, am, I, am, am, am I 
reading that wrong? <laughs> I think that's kind of what part of what we're looking at here is, uh, you know, <laughs> and, and, and Stefan might talk about his, uh, some of his studies on his, on his PhD is we're looking sort of, uh, we, we often look at sort of different leadership styles or behaviors in a silo, but we don't really look at them, you know, like as Stefan put it very well, it's like yeah. the, the leadership toolkit yeah, or yeah. the leadership golf bag, if you will. And so, and, and what, we'll, what we're finding, and Stefan will talk more about it, is, you know, we don't see a lot of studies that kind of look at a, a broad range of leadership styles. We kind of just tend to zero in on the transformational piece or a transactional or identity or, or, or shared leadership or whatever the case may be. And so we're trying to see, okay, does anybody look at these together in tandem? And if so, how might they complement each other? Um or, yeah. or maybe not, <laughs> uh, depending on the situation. But uh, you know, I think our our hypothesis would be that yeah, it probably they probably could go very well together, hand in hand. And and I think some of the work that we're going to aim to do might look at how we might be able to bring these sort of these two approaches together, um, and you know, look at either way to deliver sort of workshops or ways that we can build on the knowledge that we have and on the great work that's out there already, but actually, you know, how can we maybe improve the, the way that we understand leadership and, 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 mm. and, and go about things. Well, I was going to ask you there, Carl, I mean, as you're supervising Stefan on his PhD journey and uh, to, to discover um, what this toolkit can look like in the real world. Um, I mean, you, you, um, will have been well versed on these leadership uh, approaches, leadership theories, leadership styles um, before Stefan embarked on his studies. I mean, would you have hypothesized at that time that these two could go quite closely hand in hand? That these could be your 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 three wood and your long irons in your in your in your in your golf in your golf bag uh, to to uh, broaden that analogy? Um, yeah, could, did did you feel that they could go together? Um. I felt, yeah, I, I, I was more interested in just, you know, why do we always study sort of one type of leadership? Gotcha. It's almost like not no, nobody's sort of like a, a one trick pony, as it were, you know, coaches derive on a lot of different things from their past, from their experiences, um, you know, that's going to influence the way they coach or the way they lead. Uh, so I thought, you know, our, we need to maybe start studying leadership a little bit more broadly and trying to you know, you can't take into account every single leadership behavior that's <laughs> that's ever been delivered, but certainly, you know, a little bit more broadly than maybe just the one sort of approach that we tend to zero in on, maybe at the expense of missing out on something else. Um, and certainly if we're only looking at leadership from us at a snapshot or, or, or a couple of time points where we might, you know, have contact with, with a coach or with a team. Um, so, you know, just really trying to get a, a, a more authentic picture of, of, of what actually is going on there. We've got loads of coaches listening in, and uh, I know you will have tapped their interest in terms of transformational leadership, you know, wanting to be uh, an inspiring leader, an empowering leader, a motivational leader, taking those four eyes um, of transformational leadership, and then another four eyes in identity leadership. I'm sure coaches listening in could say, yep, yeah, this can fit neatly together, but you know what? We want to go and investigate this. We want to research this. So, uh, Stefan, tell me a little bit about uh, that side of your research. What have you discovered? What have you uncovered out there in the field? Yeah, well, the, the systematic review that um, I did on the, the two styles there, it, um, it, it pretty much looked at, first of all, how are they measuring both leadership styles? And um, there's various questionnaires that have been used for both and um, looking at the, the participants involved. And um, there's just numerous sort of themes then that have come out from it, the sort of summary characteristics of um, Hmm. We'll, we'll discuss athlete leadership um, in a while now, but what 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 came out very um, clearly is one of the big themes is that um, while coaches have a huge responsibility to to, to sort of lead the way, um, if if 
they're to have any success and um, to be an effective leader, then they, they really have to hone in on um, developing those beneath them and um, letting them raise raise up from uh, their responsibilities as well and to become like senior leaders within the team. But what, whenever we talk there, Kate, whenever Kate is talking about the, we don't really see it together. Like one study and the systematic we really caught our eye. Um, by Katrina Franson and colleagues in mm. uh, Belgium, um, they looked at what was the, like the the profile of the the optimal athlete leader, and in in this optimal profile, that leader had um, a combination of both transformation leadership and uh, identity leadership behaviors in in their locker as such. Um, so that was sort of a trigger for us that we said like. These these two shouldn't be in, um, competing against each other. That more research should be done showing the benefits of, uh, recognizing the strengths of both. So having more strengths to your bow and, um, looking, looking at what we can do here to, um, raise awareness of, the benefits of everything. Like, whenever we went to part of it for the conference, um, was fortunate to spend some time under, uh, with a chat with Cliff Mallet, um, I know you've interviewed Sergio before mm. um, and th- their studies on like serial one and coaches mm. and uh, it was really interesting to, to speak to him and he he was in agreement that like all great coaches and um, effective leaders um, have have that mix of everything like then and he says that he's of the firm belief that that it's not like it, it shouldn't be this case of saying my my uh, leadership um, theories better than yours and uh this one's not effective that we really stop need to start pulling together rather than trying to uh pull apart and uh, stand tall at the yeah. to say that uh this one works best uh so the the systematic review has been it's been really interesting just to like sort of dissect it and and look at what's been out there um both of them are still really new in the research uh field so uh, from the beginning of like the, the turn of the millennium, uh, it's really just whenever we've started to see both like well transformation leadership first come to the fore, and then identity leadership research has really only started to grow in the last decade. Um, so looking across the, the two of them, there like we've we've seen numerous things from how they both can have a a real impact on youth development. Uh, a lot of the transformation leadership is sort of focused on this area. Then, like Kyle says about understand what, how both are like different leadership approaches can be effective in different settings transformation leadership is really shown in the youth development side of things that it's really uh, valuable uh, to both uh, can keep children uh, and athletes involved in sport uh, but also to inspire them and uh, motivate them to sort of excel so to from both an engage and excel perspective um it's 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 a really valuable approach to have um all the things that came up there was the different we, we talked about the different domains the different principles from identity leadership and transformation leadership and in different settings um while one thing might work uh, in one study and we might see that individualized consideration um had a real positive on um the individual athletes having that uh had a, like a mm. negative effect in some settings for like the team performance side of things so um that was also interesting to see that whenever they, they you sort of uh split split the approach and looked at it and from different angles that um it also like th- there's numerous um outcomes associated with with both it, it's interesting there as you were speaking i really I, I picked up on one thing that you said there about transformational leadership. Um, the research evidence suggesting the, the positive impact of transformational leadership on youth development sport. At least that's what I heard. Please come back at me if I if I mistook what you said. Yeah, yeah. And it does, obviously, what <laughs> I'm probably going to do here, what you don't want me to do, which is to separate the two. And I understand what you're trying to investigate is can we or what you the position you're trying to argue here is to amalgamate the two. And I absolutely agree with you, but almost coming back to this notion of, you know, if I watch Amazon, 
Amazon Prime and I watch uh, Arteta, the Arsenal documentary. And you kind of think of at the adult elite level, that identity leadership seems to have taken pride of place for many years. You know, the Manchester United, the United Way for instance, under Sir Alex Ferguson. And, and I think every club has their way, the Liverpool way, if we're talking about you know English soccer here, but I would imagine it's the same throughout sports. Um, whereas it feels like transformational leadership um, lends itself more to a youth sport because, because it feels like it's more uh, aimed at uh, involvement, collaboration, or being autonomy supportive. That's not to suggest that uh, identity leadership isn't, but it feels like transformation. Is, transformational leadership is more about getting the participant involved. And when you, we think about younger players, from a learning perspective, that involvement increases meaning, meaning improves learning. There's no question there, guys. It's just a feel that I'm getting right now from some of the things that yeah. you're saying and, and the more that we talk. I'll jump in there. Uh, I'm glad you brought up Alex Ferguson. And, uh, <laughs> yep. Whenever we talked earlier there, we mentioned about uh, that sort of hierarchical, authoritative, di- dictated to rule, yeah. um, transactional state of leadership yeah. was really sort of at the forefront with whenever you think of your Ferguson, your Cluffs, um, maybe even your Josie Mourinho's as well. But whenever then, like you mentioned Liverpool, which uh, I can't uh, hold back my bias towards. <laughs> You're a Liverpool uh, supporter then, Stefan. Yeah, yeah. So, um, like, whenever I discuss these four domains of transformation leadership, every single one of them, you could give examples for Jurgen Klopp. Okay. Every single one. Okay. And like, if you think of, um, first of all, of where where Liverpool were whenever he came in, uh, and how he started off in his maybe first press conference from changing doubters into believers, um, and even various things like being able to sort of like model that desirable behavior you, you pretty much see the team as a reflection of him in terms of how they play in terms of his personality um mentality monsters then whenever you talk about like having like the individual consideration like if if we look back on how he dealt with um for example Allison as keeper um and send him back to brazil whenever he lost his father mm-hmm. Tragically, mm-hmm. um, not one interview did he give um, talking about results or what how the team need Allison back. It was a case of uh, take as much time as you need. Um, there's more things to life. And then whenever we're talking about how it's this or that, like if you talk then about Jurgen Klopp, every single interview he does, he really always zones in on that identity aspect um you, you hear him all the time talk about we are liverpool and this means more and all these things where like he, he there's a connection with the supporters always talks about the city even there um tragically there the young girl that lost her life last week um his press conference he talked about that he's he's in touch with the people he's connected with the people he makes the the players uh be aligned with the people uh and I think that's what a really effective leader does, that they are not just one or the other. And let's be honest as well, we know fine rightly that there's times whenever he needs to be that transactional leader and that yeah. th- that he has to step up to it uh, and do do a different set of things. Like he, he had to get rid of um, Mamadou Sacco um, in his very early days, um, similar to Aubameyang, because he didn't follow uh, team protocols and was late for... Uh, a team meeting so like he has that ruthless side to him as well um but i think he's a brilliant example they talk about how um your golf bag of being able to pull out whatever whatever club you need yeah i think that's well said because you're just speaking i mean the notes i've written down here and you think of all of those well to alex ferguson and and jürgen klopp but also pep guardiola um uh, Emma Hayes at Chelsea right now. I mean, so many great coaches um, who are identity impresarios and, and they set down their identity prototype, to, prototype don't they? Values and behaviours, their identity impresarios um, in, in as much as I would imagine players have to embody and enact 
um, values and, and behaviors in all activities. Um, and then when we go to the transformational stuff, yes, I'm, I'm probably earlier I was forgetting a little bit about the continuum and just noting that all of those coaches that I've mentioned um, would certainly run along that that continuum uh, depending on depending on uh, what the context demanded or the situation demanded or, or, or the person required. I mean, Carl, you're, you're patiently listening in uh, there. I don't know if you have any thoughts from Canadian sport but or, or, or just thoughts on some of the things that we're, we're saying here. Do you, would, you, would you back up what we're uh, alluding to here? Uh, absolutely. And I think the real key thing with that identity leadership is getting – the group members it's getting that identity of identifying as the group it's it's the we it's yeah. the us it's not the oh well you guys are are doing this it's we when we win we when we lose you know we on and off the pitch or you know the field of play it's the the values that are you associate that embody being a part of that group and being a part of that team whether that's the United way, the Liverpool way, whatever your persuasion, <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, and I, I think that's really it. And, and it's not just from the, the athletes, it's from the coaches, it's from, you know, the backroom staff, you know, even you know, the fans, the community, the broader community, it has that, that sense of, of collective uh, and, and that identity and that we, and, and, and you, they refer to themselves as such. Um, I think that, and that's always a sort of a key, almost unconscious uh, giveaway that you can see, okay, our, our what is how is this group in terms mm-hmm. of their you know cohesiveness or 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 how do they view themselves you know are are they saying uh, referring themselves as that as that collective we or is there is there still sometimes that uh, you know that arm's length separation that where oh sometimes it's we sometimes it's well they they are doing this and and they're not including themselves as part of that you know uh, identity or that group. And, and so really that's what identity leadership, I think, works towards is getting everybody uh, on default to be that, you know, it's always we, no matter the, the situation. And, 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 you know, as you're speaking now, it, it's making me think of, I mean, uh, Stefan, as a, as a Liverpool fan, I'm, I'm sure you're not too devastated at the uh, challenges that Manchester United have had in recent years. But it, it, it makes me think, when we think of identity leadership and this notion of the United way, that um, I mean, trying to stay as uh, as as ethical as I can here, given that I, I, I've not you know been in at Manchester United, so I don't one hundred percent know know the story or the picture. But you know, um, I, I'm sure we can talk a little bit about this. Um, if on the one hand an organisation is saying, "Well, we have this united way," but really that was created devised created laid down by a, a specific leader that being sir alex ferguson and then uh when he retired other leaders have come in and the organization has tried to retain this label of the united way which really was arguably sir alex ferguson's way that feels um feels like an impossible job an impossible task um Again, not a question, but just just a thought. Yeah, well, like I heard uh, an interview that Roy Keane had with Gary Neville there last week, and they were sort of going through his um, sort of like key moments mm. throughout his career. And uh, one of the ones I don't know if you've seen it was going around Twitter and stuff was whenever they won the league and Alex Ferguson came up and mm. hugged Roy Keane, and uh, Gary Neville laughed at him and says, "Look." There you go. These were close there. He hugged you there, and he goes, "Look at it. Like it's it's a crocodile hug. It was like just a case of there you go, Roy, and off you go, Roy. And it was very much sort of that just transactional relationship. And you can see just even that hurt that he still has today that how he was let down by the club, and like he pretty much gave his life. Uh, Manchester United was okay. his identity, and you you just see then like how. He obviously felt let down by it, and he, it's like the scars are deep there. Um, and I think it sort of comes back to like you look at the likes of a Southampton or an Ajax and uh, Barcelona, the clubs that say that this is our way, mm. the managers that come in, they have to fit the club DNA, the club model, uh, rather than 
going from uh, what's in vogue at the, at the moment, yeah. um, which I think is really, really, really important. It's interesting. And, and I love the work that you're both doing, um, looking to um, find commonalities across theories and approaches and across practice. Um, something we haven't spoken much about, if at all, on the Sports Site show has been athlete leadership. And uh, one of the things you mentioned earlier, Stefan, was identity leadership and its importance with regard creating senior leaders. I think I heard you correctly there. There was some evidence around that. Um, creating se- senior leaders within a team. I mean, athlete leadership is becoming, I think, becoming more and more important Um now uh, i in my own work i hear as a general broad brush statement and it really is a general broad brush statement coaches might say oh we haven't got any leaders anymore this generation aren't leaders again broad brush statement from myself and from everybody there by by actually suggesting that so how can how can transformational leadership and identity leadership actually help to create athlete leaders or how can their involve what what's their involvement in athlete leadership well uh, across across the board and the, the studies that we've seen the a lot of them that they've viewed it like they've, that they've tried to hone in on where is this leadership coming from hmm. a lot of it comes from formal and informal athlete leaders um so whenever we talk about your sort of formal leaders, we, we think about your, your captains, vice captains of the team, and the informal leaders is a really interesting one. Um, because Franson and all had a study in 2014 where they found that it was these informal leaders who like were really, really valuable and that only 1% of the study of like over 4,500 participants demonstrated that their, key, their team captain was the best at uh, various different leadership roles. So um, like the task leader, the motivational leader, the external leader, the, the social leader, sorry, an external leader. And what what they've pretty much highlighted, and I think uh, Hodge's study in 2014 on the All Blacks, and, and then obviously James Kerr had his book on um, legacy as well. Mm-hmm. We, we've seen so much of this starting to filter through where you're seeing like this dual management model where coaches are recognizing that if we're able to get your athletes on board, then the impact that it can have in terms of long-term success uh, is, is much, much more. Um, like if we're wanting to develop your culture, um, like in, I know um, I mentioned Owen Eastwood earlier, but uh, and even you had Michael Gervais on uh, previously. Mm. I feel that over the next 10 years, like we had that, the growth area there in performance analysis and stats uh, for a decade and uh, S&C and it's, it's all blown up. I, f- I feel like the, the guys that over the next decade, we're going to see a real growth in team dynamics and um, how, how can we really like have better cultures? Um, and for me at the forefront of that is having athlete leadership um, strong athlete leadership in your in your groups you mentioned i think i i heard you say f- formal leaders and informal leaders um yeah. i mean carl are you able to speak a bit more to the difference between the two at all yeah absolutely so we'll, we'll go back in time and to sort of again kind of studying and not trying to understand athlete leadership in sport is still a relatively new, you know, area of Mm. research, you know, it really only goes back 15, 20 years and, you know, give credit to sort of Todd Lahey, who was my master supervisor and his colleagues, Mark Ice, James Hardy, they sort of really started to delve into this, into this area in sport and looking at athlete leadership and, you know, trying to advance an understanding, a definition that they found it was kind of comprised of your formal and informal roles um, formal leadership being those assigned uh, roles, such as the team captain, whether that's appointed by the coach or elected by the team, everyone's sort of acknowledged that's this person is in a, a, a given, uh, you know, pre-designated mm-hmm. role. And that's sort of identified and agreed on by everybody. 
However, there's also informal leaders, which probably didn't get as much attention that can sort of emerge from the interactions within the group. And the key thing with informal leaders is that they don't have to be a leader to everybody on the team. They can be a leader to sort of smaller groups of athletes right. on the team. And so, and this kind of comes into this idea of share leadership. So it doesn't have to be one person doing all things, being all things to all people all the time. You know, and especially when you have larger, larger groups and larger teams, you might be split into offensive and defensive units, for example. You might have sub leaders and or 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 you know position specialists or something like that that can serve in different leadership uh, roles and capacities. And actually, a lot of the studies that we show that you know, athletes and teams view that a lot of teams have maybe fifty percent, two thirds of their roster could be viewed as. Uh, occupying or, or delivering some sort of informal leadership behavior. So really, when you view leadership in this way, it can be available to a much wider um, part of the team membership. And that actually encourages athletes to maybe to be able to take initiative and, and step into leadership roles, you know, when they're ready to do so. And, and they don't necessarily have to wait their turn to be appointed the captain or the assistant captain, which really ad- advances everyone um, in the process. And if you, if you think of like your your formal leaders, like your um, even your Stephen Gerrard's back in time, he would have spoke openly about how th- that motivational aspect, um, the motivational leader in the dressing room didn't like that, um, would have left that to likes of Jimmy Carragher. Um, so we, we see a lot of um, the formal leaders, um, they they might behave as a, a leader by their their actions um, and. How, how they like um, perform on the pitch and bring in others with them in that way. Um, whereas you, you might have your motivational leader who, who, who really excels in the, the team talks and talking to the players whenever they're in the small groups. And also like the, the, the social leader, like um, might not necessarily be the best player, mm-hmm. but is the glue behind the team and uh, can play like a key role in terms of, uh, maybe like group outings um, and keeping that sort of social cohesion um, really tight between the group and uh, organizing trips and things together. And then you have like your your external leader who sort of represents the group on, um, for example, maybe like um, your Jordan Henderson, whatever, who's, who's, who's done things about um, taking a knee, uh, taking it for uh, stand up to racism or like it could be like discussing player contracts, player welfare, so on. I love this because I've got two things to say here. Firstly, um, as you started to introduce this idea or, or, or broaden this idea of informal leadership, Carl, it was it was making me think of having a real taking a real optimistic viewpoint of behaviour, um, which I think is important within any team, any organisation, and by coaches. If you can seek out, I mean, that quiet leadership, if you like, if you can seek out certain behaviours as belonging to leadership behaviours and actually um, um, define that as a leadership behavior i think that's that that is really really important because it kind of pushes back with that notion of well we this generation we don't have any leadership anymore and just a player simply putting their arm around a teammate uh, having a laugh with it whatever it might be even the smallest possible behavior could be could be construed as leadership perhaps that was the first thing i i i garnered from from what you were saying and then the second thing mm-hmm. as as you built on uh, what Carl was saying uh, there, Stefan, was, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't claim any empiricism here. I've always, when I've spoken to coaches about leadership, um, I've I've informally sort of said, well, you've got leaders who lead by action, you've got leaders who lead via um, energy, and you've got leaders who lead socially, and you've got leaders who lead um, via instruction. Because in my experience, there's there are the reality is there are players who are great energizers, but they're not that great at instructing others on on the field of play. It just th- their brains don't necessarily work like that. To put it in in simple terms, um, so what I love about this, in many respects, is you kind of empiricize what I'm saying there by informal leaders. You know, you could actually because I have sat down and thought, well, there's so many different types of leadership when you yeah. really think about it. You know, uh, so yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> I've got some research evidence behind my rambles with coaches. Brilliant. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Well, you're spot on, man. Like all all those functions that you you know that you mentioned would be supported, yeah. you know, in the research, and and it's, it's certainly that is the way it sort of it seems to uh, present themselves in in these in these group settings. And we even now we see coaches that are starting to recognize that you know they'll, they'll actually start to see um, you know these leadership groups or leadership uh, athlete leadership teams that they they put together of of various you know, players with maybe some of these various functions that you mentioned. And, um, and they sort of have that, uh, that, that, that go-to leadership panel that they'll turn to. And I think Jurgen Klopp's even done that as well. And has a, has a kind of a, a group of, of players that, that are, that he looks to as his sort of his, his athlete leadership team. Yeah. And for example, Trent Alexander and Andy Robertson and, um, Allison, the three of those weren't in the leadership team a few years ago. Uh, because of a few mm-hmm. players that moved on, such as Ewan Aldum, um, Adam Lallana, and I'm struggling to remember now who was the third one. But they then, within the group, the players voted uh, for who would they step up to be the, the new leaders yeah. in this senior leadership team. Um, and then in terms of the systematic review, just go back to yeah. that, uh, from the transformation leadership and the identity leadership perspective, some of the outcomes that we we've seen then that um, appeared from having athlete leadership um, and using transformation leadership behaviors or identity leadership behaviors yeah. resulted in um, improved task and social cohesion, uh, competence, confidence, uh, connection with the group, uh, communication um, within the team, um, other things such as reducing uh, burnout, the, the, psychological safety as well which um, is coming up a lot recently uh, and just having that team identification having a stronger uh, connected team um, where the, the motivation and transit motivation w- was driven by the players n- not just by the coaches you've kept all the academic sports psychs happy there uh, Stefan right at the end by uh, relating leadership with uh, uh, positive psychological <laughs> processes yeah, there's a there's a good relationship okay. there. Listen, I think to close, what I'd like to do is is kind of reflect back to both of you what I'm hearing here, and then we'll get final thoughts from you both. Um, so, uh, a real passion here uh, from from you guys as a, as a collection of researchers uh, at the University of Ulster, but I'm sure there are others involved as well, far and wide. Mm-hmm. Uh, around exploring the relationship between leadership theories and leadership approaches, not necessarily just siloing them off and, and, and researching them, but actually seeing where the relationships lie. Because ultimately, we lead in a messy world, a complex world. And so actually, as you've, I love your analogy, your golf analogy, being a former pro golfer as well, I particularly align with it. You know, I've got my, 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 my bag of leadership clubs tools tricks that i can use because it's complex it's messy lots of individual differences complex situations today we've spoken about transformational leadership and identity leadership and brought those together both have four eyes and and on that transformational side it's not just there's a continuum there it's not just about being transformational it could also be about being transactional again context matters and this is relevant for all coaches this is relevant for all coaches in terms of the what how why you know you know what do I want to do here as a leader how am I going to lead this why am I leading in this way and these theories combined can actually give us a a why for what we're doing um and and this also spills out into athlete leadership um, as well. So transformational leadership and identity leadership are relevant for athlete leadership in terms of formal leadership and informal leadership. That's what I'm hearing from you both. That's my that's my summary of from our conversation um, today. I love it. Uh, some final thoughts. I don't mind who goes first. Stefan, do you want to do you want to give me your thoughts? Oh, I think you, you you couldn't have summed it up any better there. No, that was a uh, fantastic. Well, what, what's next for you in terms of this uh, journey? Uh, hopefully have uh, my doctorate in the next 12 months, um, all things going well. Um, beyond that, I'm doing some teaching at the university, lecturing in uh, a few modules in sports psychology and PE. Uh, so hopefully can 
uh, continue doing that. Uh, and pretty much one of the drivers behind doing this PhD and the Masters is for my own coaching. And I want to hopefully become the uh, best coach as I possibly can. And for me, having a awareness and of that psychological pillar, I think, is um, something that I didn't really get from sort of formal coach education. Uh, so hopefully I can potentially give back uh, to coach education with more maybe interpersonal focused um, programs um, looking at leadership. Liverpool's next assistant coach. <laughs> I'm actually just uh, reading uh, his book at the moment, Pep Linders, assistant. His, yeah, uh, Pep Linders, yeah. yeah. Well, when he moves on, when he gets his uh, own uh, head coaching job, then uh, maybe you step into that role. And uh, Kyle? sum up your thoughts on this area this journey and 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 what's next uh, for you aside from helping uh, Stefan through his PhD there yeah I mean as you know the work's never done and certainly leadership is a is a very well researched area not only in sport but in in, 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 in other contexts um, but yeah there's, there's always there's always more we can try to move the needle or inch along mm-hmm. a little bit further and so we'll, we'll try to to add our little piece to the pie if, uh, if we can and, and, and see how, how these different types of leadership approaches, you know, might work in tandem with each other. And just, and, you know, we kind of know we do practically, they, they do practically, but just sort of, again, maybe looking at it empirically as well. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quite fortunate to have, uh, you know, a lot of, of, of keen PhD researchers like Stefan <laughs> that, uh, that I'm supervising at the minute. And so uh, I guess that's keeping me very busy um at, at ulster um but it's great and uh i'm looking forward to seeing uh stefan complete as, as i'm sure he is as well <laughs> over the next year or so um so yes yeah, so, so, so stay tuned and hopefully we can we can share uh some of the findings from from his upcoming studies as well well how can how can people stay tuned so um uh, kyle how can people follow you and find your work Sure. Well, you can uh, obviously Ulster University website. Uh, my profile is on there uh, on Twitter um, at Kyle Paradis. Stefan has a, a Twitter account as well. And uh, so we can certainly uh, keep keep in touch with our, our, our conference uh, goings and, and presentations there and, and publications that, that will come out of this, uh, this work for those who are interested. And of course, can always get in touch and, and send us an email as well. And, and uh, Carl, you mentioned that Stefan, <laughs> Stefan, you've got a Twitter account. What's your? How can people follow you, and how can people get in touch to learn more about your research if you'd like to be contacted? Yeah, mine's is a really tricky one. That's at Stefan Derry. Um, <laughs> that's S. That's S T E A F A N, and then D E A R Y. Correct. Almost D double E R Y. D double E R Y failed at the final hurdle so <laughs> stefan at stefan deary and then how can people i know you will have uh, tapped their interest in terms of reading some of your papers and uh, so how can people get in contact there um well if you, if you want to reach out to me there in the twitter handle um through my university email um which is deary d-e-e-r-y uh dash s3 at ulster.ac.uk uh, so happy to oblige and we'll be hopefully publishing uh, some some of the research in the next few months. So uh, we'll, we'll try to share those online and social media as well. Fantastic. Well, I can't thank you both enough for coming on to talk to us about leadership. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dan. Thanks for having us. Dan, thanks very much. Enjoyed that. Well, everybody, I really enjoyed that podcast and I'd love to hear what you, the listener, think. So please do get in touch via Twitter or Facebook or through my website, danabrahams.com, to tell me what you think of the Sports Site Show and be delighted if you'd have any suggestions for me. Uh, I'm already looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now.